Bibles or your pew Bibles, let us listen carefully to God's Word read and ask the Lord to speak to us through His Word and by the power of His Spirit. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, Judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. For we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. We cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word written, preserved perfectly for us by the power of your Holy Spirit. We thank you that this spirit, your spirit, the third person of the Trinity, has inspired uh, these individuals to write down truly what happened. And we thank you, O oh Lord, for this record of the boldness of Peter and John, the apostles before the Sanhedrin. But we thank you, too, that Luke has shown us clearly that it is only as they were filled by the Spirit and because they had been with Jesus that they could speak thus. And so, Father, we pray that these words of truth, your words, would sink deep into our hearts and lives, and that you, by the power of your Spirit, would change us too. Father, we know that we must be born again. This is what Jesus taught consistently, what your, all of your scriptures teach. So please, we pray that if there, if there are some that do not know you in this way, that today they would, so that we together might as your people live lives of obedience to you by your strength and grace and for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today uh, around the nation uh, is Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. Uh, it was started uh, back by presidential proclamation. Ronald Reagan uh, set aside a day uh, that after Roe v. Wade, 1973, for uh, particularly uh, those who uh, value life to recognize it, stand up and say it. And so we do. We stand up and say that life is precious. Life of all ages, of all shapes, of all sizes, of all educational backgrounds, of all skin color, it's all precious. It's precious because all of us, uh, every human being has been made in the image of God. This is the testimony of Scripture from the very beginning, a testimony that is consistent throughout Scripture that God cares about His creatures and cares particularly about mankind, about men and women, because He has made them, He has created them in His image. In the image of God, He made them male and female. He made them, Genesis says. This, Sunday, or this Friday will be the March for Life in Washington, D.C., where people go down and uh, recognize the hor horrific toll uh, that uh, abortion on demand has taken in our country. I don't know if you've seen, perhaps on the Internet or Facebook or wherever, the, the, the pie chart uh, that shows the number of Americans killed. Uh, the number of Americans killed in the Civil War, uh, the Vietnam War, uh, World War II, one, World War II, is minuscule compared to the number of people killed by abortion. Minuscule. And so we must take this, uh, this seriously, and we must understand that even as Peter and John stood up boldly in front of this particular court, the Sanhedrin, we too must stand up and speak boldly. It's not only for the unborn that we must speak, and it's not only speaking that we must do, but we must understand what the Bible says and how the gospel impacted, impacts us. Because Peter and John, as has already been noted, Peter and John didn't stand up and speak in their own strength, not even because it was for a good cause. They didn't stand up and speak because there was a community of like-minded people behind them cheering them on. They didn't stand up and speak because there was any benefit in it for them. They stood up and spoke because they were filled with the Spirit and because they had been with Jesus. And they were compelled to speak because of those two truths. So look with me, please, at, at this again, and, and let me help us uh, once more with the, with the context, of, particularly if you weren't here last week, to hear from uh, the beginning of the chapter to these verses. Uh, Peter and John, as we know from chapter 3, had gone to the temple on the, at the ninth hour, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, to pray. Uh, the temple was still a meeting place for God's people, uh, although it was transitioning from that. 
Uh, this wasn't the only place where God's people were Christians, where the church prayed, but it was one of the places. And so Peter and John as apostles attended this stated time of prayer to join with God's people in praising his name. And as they came to the temple to pray, there was a beggar who was there at the gate and the beggar asked them for alms, asked them for help, help you know, wanted some sustenance. And uh, Peter looks at him and says, silver and gold have I none, but what I do have I will give you in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And immediately the man was healed. This, this was a, con a, a congenital illness of some sort. He, was, he had been in, crippled from birth. Uh, he was 40 years old, we find out at the end of chapter 4. This was a, an undeniable miracle. In fact, if you're, if you're back with me in chapter 3, you'll notice that immediately, uh, instantly, verse 7, uh, the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. There was no question that this man was healed, no question that he was healed perfectly. And it was by the authority of the risen Lord Jesus Christ, and Peter takes this opportunity, and John as well, to share the gospel truth with the people who are gathered around in wonderment and amazement because they recognized him. I don't know if on your trips to work or in your neighborhood, uh, well, hopefully in your neighborhood you recognize your neighbors, right? I, I hope that as, you, as they drive into their driveway and you drive into your driveway and, and they get out of their car and that you get out of your car, that you at least wave. You know that these people belong, right? They, they, they live there, and you're getting to know them a little bit. Well, in a similar fashion, the people who came to the temple at the ninth hour at 3 o'clock in the afternoon recognized this man. They knew about him. Forty years he had been brought daily by his friends, by his family, to come and beg at, the, the, at, the, at this particular gate and they recognized him and they were astonished. And Peter takes the opportunity to share with them the truth about Jesus Christ. The, the truth that, that this Jesus, who he was crucified, but God has raised him from the dead. And, and he's the Savior. He's the Messiah. He's the promised one. Look to him and be saved. Look to him and find forgiveness of your sins, Peter says. And, and as he's preaching this gospel message uh, because, to the crowd, the, the leaders, the religious leaders, particularly uh, in the beginning of chapter 4, we see groups of people, the priests, the captain, the temple guard, and the Sadducees, they come up to him with hostile intent. They come up to Peter and John uh, angrily, just greatly disturbed, and they arrest him. And they put him on trial for this good thing that they had done. And uh, I, I hope you're familiar enough, perhaps not, though, with your New Testament and you kids should be, if you attend Sunday school, you should know, right? There are two main religious groups in the New Testament. There are the Sadducees and there are the Pharisees. And, and for you adults who maybe haven't heard this before, how do you tell the difference between the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Well, the Sadducees are sad, you see, because they didn't believe in the resurrection. Let me say it again. Maybe you didn't get it. The Sadducees are sad, you see, because they didn't believe in the resurrection. Right? Well, what were Peter and John preaching? They were preaching the resurrection. What does the gospel message entail? The resurrection. The cross and the resurrection are central to our message because they're central to our hope. They're central to the life and, and accomplishment of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came to earth not just to live and do good to many, not just to live and heal people of their, of their sicknesses and disease, although he did that because he loves us, but he came to die and to die a particular kind of death, a death on the cross as the perfect sacrifice. And this death that he died, he did not stay dead. He rose again. And so the resurrection is part and parcel of what we believe. It's where our hope rests, that we have a living Savior who is even now with us because he's alive, although he's in heaven, not here on earth. And so the Sadducees uh, did not believe in the resurrection and felt very threatened by Jesus Christ and his ministry and by the ministry of the apostles and the disciples they're preaching. And so they come and they put them on trial. And the Sadducees, the other thing you need to know about the Sadducees were that they were, uh, they were uh, I don't know, holding hands with the Romans. They, they were ones who were uh, the wealthy, uh, the privileged, uh, the intellectual elite, and, and so they rubbed shoulders with other powerful people. 
And as the Romans came and uh, conquered this part of the land and the expansion of their empire, uh, they saw, as it were, which side of the bread their, uh, their butter was on. Is that how you say it? Uh, which side of their butter the bread? The bread was buttered on. Thank you. Which side of the bread the, it was buttered? But they knew, in other words, you, that they had better appease the Romans. They better not make waves. You see, in the Old Testament, when God had set apart his people, he had given them very specific laws. And these specific laws were to set apart his people as consecrated to him. They were never ever meant to only be an external rite or ceremony. They were always meant to express the reality of faith and life in the heart. The right relationship with God expressed in a separation from the world. The Sadducees, when Rome came in, and, and even before this, but the Sadducees, when they got into power, they said, well, we can still do the external part, but it's not really going to come from a heart that's given fully to God because we love our power, we love our pleasure, we love our comfort, we love the privileges of where we are. And so the Sadducees didn't want anything to rock the boat, and Jesus rocked the boat. But we need to ask ourselves as we're looking at the Sadducees and thinking to ourselves that, boy, I am mainly in the place of Peter and John. I can mainly identify with them because I too am a Christian and I know that I want this kind of boldness in my life and speech. We need to take a minute to step back and ask ourselves, am I really more like the Sadducees? Am I really more like these religious leaders that were people of privilege and power that really wanted to hold on to that and so compromised the truth of their faith? Let me just read to you from uh, this, uh, this book by Dennis Johnson on the message of Acts as he quotes from the novel uh, The Children of Men by P.D. James. Perhaps you've read some of her works. Uh, the Children of Men is set in the future and sterility has fallen on the human race for the last uh, several decades. Uh, the world, uh, in this world without a future, people willingly exchange personal liberty for immediate comfort. They ignore exploitation and uh, government coerced suicide. Prudent people willingly silence conscience in exchange for the blessings promised by the state security, comfort, and pleasure. That is freedom from fear, freedom from want, freedom from boredom. Wow. Can we identify? The Sadducees could. Freedom from want, freedom from persecution, freedom from boredom. I don't know about that, but that's certainly part and parcel of all, our culture. And so, when we look at this text and we pray to be more like Peter and John, we must ask ourselves, first of all, am I really living, not what I'm confessing with my lips, but am I really living more like the Sadducees who won't rock the boat because they don't want to mess up their life. They've got a good life and they want to keep it. Peter and John are not like that. Peter and John, let's just look here in your, in your Bibles and how they're described by Luke, by even the Sadducees. Verse 13, they saw Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men. They were not in positions of power in the society or privilege in the culture. They were not part of the religious establishment. They were not, they didn't have weight where it mattered. They couldn't uh, whisper into an ear and have it happen. They were unschooled in that sense. Not that they were illiterate, but that they, they didn't know the right people. They didn't have pull or influence. They didn't sit under the, the, the exceptional teachers of the day and get their training from that. They were ordinary people. They were common people. They had regular jobs. Uh, they were they were part and parcel of the, of the community. They didn't stand out. They were ordinary people, but 
one of the things that set them apart was that these men had been with Jesus. These men had been with Jesus. They were his disciples. They had been chosen by him, and they had stayed with him. Day and night, they had walked and talked with Jesus. They had been taught by him, instructed by him. They had been, they'd had their eyes opened by his teaching and by his spirit. They knew Jesus. And because they knew Jesus and believed in Jesus, they had been born again. And so they had seen the kingdom of God. And they'd seen Jesus die on a cross, but also seen the risen Savior who had spoken to them and taught them, who had opened up the scriptures of the Old Testament to them so that they could see that all of the prophecies and promises and pictures in the Old Testament pointed to Jesus. And all of the problems in the Old Testament, because the Old Testament is a very honest book. It doesn't just show God's people in the best of light. It shows them in the worst of light. It shows them in the reality of their sins. But the problem that the Old Testament uh, highlights is a problem that can only be solved by God. The need of salvation for our sins. These men had been with Jesus and they knew the gospel. And they believed it. And so, because of, they knew the gospel, they were ready to suffer for Christ. They were ready to suffer for the gospel. They were ready to speak up of what they knew was true and not be silenced because they had to speak the truth. Perhaps one, nice, one good way of saying this is that these men, these disciples, and the rest of the believers too, as we'll see uh, as we move through the rest of this chapter, the rest of these, all of these believers had been shaped by the cross. They'd been shaped by Christ who had died on a cross and risen. And so they were cross-shaped disciples ready to give their lives for God and others. Ready to die to self, ready to sacrifice, ready to serve. They were shaped by the cross of Christ. And so they live they lived cross-shaped lives. Now, that wasn't true of the Sadducees. The Sadducees lived lives of comfort and privilege and position and did everything in their power to keep it that way. But the Christians were ready to die. The Christians were ready to die to self. The Christians were ready to go out of their way to do good to others. The Christians understood that the cross comes before the crown. The Sadducees didn't and did everything in their power to silence these disciples. The verses that we just read this morning show us the end of the trial. They called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. Remember, this was the group, this was the court, these were the leaders that had condemned Jesus Christ to die, taken him to Herod and Pilate, and seen him and shouted him to the cross. And they command. They didn't suggest. They didn't pull him aside and say, you know what, it'd be a good idea if. No, they, with all their authority, they commanded them not to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. And that, there was some weight to that authority. They could make life miserable for these disciples. But what's the response? Because they, they knew Christ, because they were filled with the Spirit, because they understood the cross and the gospel, this is what they say. Judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. And in just the next chapter, chapter 5, we'll see them rearrested and before the same group of people. And Peter will say again even more boldly, we must obey God rather than you. We must. We must. We cannot help verse 20, speaking about what we have seen and heard. You see, the gospel for them, Jesus Christ for them, their faith was more than just a profession. It was more than just abstract knowledge. Jesus is real, and they knew the real Jesus. Their faith was living and active because they were filled with the Spirit of Jesus who is living and active. And they knew God's word. They knew what they had seen, and they knew what they had heard, and they were willing to bet their life, as it were, on these truths. Their lives were not built on sand 
that shifted at every breeze. Their lives were not characterized by living, as it were, on waves that bounced them up and down and to and fro. They had bedrock convictions. And these bedrock convictions came out of knowing Jesus, knowing Christ, and knowing the Christ who taught them all of God's word. Jesus Christ, after he was raised, before he ascended into heaven, spent days with them, weeks with them, opening up the scriptures and showing them that they all pointed to the necessity of the Savior suffering and to God raising him from the dead. They all pointed to this as the only way of salvation. They all pointed to this as a demonstration of the love of God. They all pointed to this as the way to live. I wonder if our convictions are so solid when it comes not only to the sanctity of human life, but to a multitude of other things that our culture is saying all sorts of things about. Where we might be passed over for promotion or shut down, where we might ha be disciplined in our job or at school for speaking the truth in love, where we cannot any longer say what Scripture says without fear of reprisal, even though our persecution does not raise to the level of others. How will we live? How will we live when people tell us to be silent, when they tell us to shut up, when they say, you can't say that, you can't do that? Will the gospel make such a difference in our lives that we will say along with Peter and John, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard, not just seen and heard in Sunday school, not just seen and heard uh, because we've been raised in the church, but seen and heard because we know the living Savior ourselves. Jesus says to Nicodemus, John 3, 7, you must be born again. And the question that I'd like us to ask ourselves today is have we been born again? Have I been born again? It's... it's a good question to ask. Even if your immediate answer is yes, ask yourself again. Because if we have been born again, then Jesus is our king. And we will be compelled to live differently than the world. Is the world dominant in your life? In the decisions you make? Are the let me put it this way, are the decisions you make in, your, in how you live, in how you spend your time, in how you spend your money, in what you say, how you say it, what you don't say, who's dominant in your life? Who's determining these things for you? Because as much as we say, I'm making my own decisions, we know that's not really always true. There are other factors that decide how we live and what we say. And oftentimes it's the world. When the world says, no, you can't say that, we say, oh, sorry, okay, I didn't mean to offend anybody. Or perhaps we're not that explicit. Perhaps we just say, well, I'll go speak to those who, who appreciate what I'm saying. And we gather together with like-minded, understood, standing people, and we kibitz with each other. And that's as far as the good news gets. We can't have that. We must speak up. If Jesus Christ rules our hearts, our lives will be different. We'll no longer be focused inwardly, but upwardly and outwardly. We'll live for him regardless of the cost. We'll be like Peter and John in the boldness because we've spent time in the word and we've spent time with God and we know that we live under his authority. One of the things that characterized Jesus Christ in his ministry was the authority with which he taught. Do you remember reading that in Mark, particularly? Mark's fast-paced gospel. Immediately, Jesus goes and does this. Immediately, he goes and does that. And as he speaks consistently, the, the, what, the amazement is that he speaks as one with authority, not like the other teachers. Where did that authority come from? It certainly came from the fact that he is the very Son of God, that he is the Word incarnate. But it also came because he trusted and knew that God's word is true. Because he's the author of it. What the Bible says, God says. But until we believe that and live under this authority, we will not be able to speak with authority ourselves. 
But Peter and John did. They weren't afraid to say to the highest court in the land, the highest religious court in the land, that you put this Jesus to death. But God has raised him from the dead. That kind of boldness may get us into trouble in the world, but it's how God wants us to live. And it's how we must live and how we will live if our lives have really been changed. May we as God's people encourage one another in this because it's not easy. May we pray with and for each other. May we stand together and spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. But whether you stand together or whether you feel like you're standing alone, stand and speak. Because these are the words of life. And the world needs these words as well as our actions. Because they have no idea of the danger that they're in. All too often, they're walking blindly. If you and I love God, we will love others. But we cannot do this unless we've been born again by the Spirit of God. If you've been born again by the Spirit of God, you will love God and love others. And you will know the compulsion to say we cannot be silent because we must testify to what we have seen and heard. Let's pray. Father, as we come to you and ask for your help in answering the question in our own hearts, have I been born again by your spirit? We pray, O oh Lord, that you would give us the assurance of new life by the promises of your word and by the power of the spirit testifying to our souls. We thank you that we can cry out to you for help and for strength. And we ask, O oh Lord, that you would indeed help us to stand and to speak. We pray, Father, that you would give us eyes, too, to see where the needs are that we can help meet and that we would be able, by your grace and for your glory, to go to where the needs are and not just expect people to come to us. Father, please help us in these things for your, your name's sake and for the good of those that we minister to and speak to, that your spirit would go before us and that many would come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. For we know that we ourselves can save no one, but we also know that Jesus Christ is the Savior. And so we pray confidently in his name. Amen.